Coming up on this week's show, Jason Gaffney and Kevin Held are back to discuss their latest film project and their podcast. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 180 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from willkanaus.com, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hi, everybody. This episode of the show is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. We will have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week, so be sure and stay tuned for that. Welcome back, everyone, for another week. Uh, We've got some great book recs coming up for you, Uh, so hang out and uh, join us, won't you? (laughs) Uh, it was a busy week for me this week. I had to finish a book, and that is always like the most stressful week of uh, that there possibly could be, at least in my view. Uh, Hat Trick, the, the revision V2.0, as I've started calling it on social media periodically, went off to Harmony Inc. to start the editing process. We're looking to get that out sometime in December. So super excited about that. Mm-hmm. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, we had a little mini celebration. We went out and did something. We, we went, did something? Oh, my God. <laughs> we went and saw Captain Marvel yesterday uh, and enjoyed it thoroughly. Yes. I think this might be certainly in my most favorite of all the superhero movies and in the Marvel Universe. This is right up there with Thor Ragnarok. It just had a good vibe to it. It was funny. It had good backstory. Uh, as a heroine, Captain Marvel is certainly something, sir, and a, hero, a superhero I didn't know all that much about going into the movie because I always, I admit, get Captain Marvel and Shazam mixed up, and they they shouldn't get mixed up, but they get mixed up in my head um, from my childhood. So, yeah, and Brie Larson and Samuel L. Jackson just have the best chemistry ever. So, what were your thoughts, sir? I enjoyed it very much as well. In the hockey player's heart. The feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart in ebook, paperback, or as an audiobook performed by me, Vince Sterling, wherever you buy books. So the first book I want to quickly talk about is Wanted Bad Boyfriend by T.A. Moore. And this is essentially a small town romance, but instead of like a small, quaint little town with little church steeples and white picket fences, it is on a small uh, island in the UK, in the British Isles. And our story is about a guy named Nathan. He is the wedding planner at the big hotel on the island. Um, That's really the main tourist trade for the town. Uh, It's essentially sort of a destination wedding place, you know, get married on the cliffs by the sea, that kind of thing. So he's their official planner, and he's busy organizing the wedding of an actress and a footballer. Now, it didn't, like, go into them specifically, but I think they mentioned that the actress had been on Holyoaks, and um, the other guy was a footballer, um, so I'm from the U S and it's not David <laughs> Beckham. Then who the fuck cares? Um, <laughs> as it, ter- well, okay. As, as the story progresses, um, the bride and groom are actually, you know, perfectly nice, but the, the vibe I got was that they're kind of like C list celebrities, like the kind of celebs who'd end up on like celebrity big brother. <laughs> <laughs> so poor Nathan is like tasked with giving them their perfect dream wedding. And while he's busy doing that, he comes up with the brilliant idea to get himself a fake boyfriend. 
Why, you might ask? It's because everyone on the island is up in his business and they constantly want to like set him up with their like one gay friend. Uh, and he, <laughs> he is totally over it. He is done. So he comes up with the plan to get himself a fake boyfriend, but not just any fake boyfriend, a bad fake boyfriend. That way he can get his heart broken in front of absolutely everyone and they will leave him alone. <laughs> They'll be okay. like, oh, oh, poor Nathan. <laughs> we can't fix him up for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it'll give him a respite. So the one man for the job is Flynn Delaney, and he is the local mechanic. Everybody in town hates this guy because he's like grumpy and gruff and surly, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, we all know that's just on the outside. Um, really, on the inside, he is a marshmallow and a totally nice guy. Um, <laughs> imagine Luke Danes from the Gilmore Girls. Okay. Luke is always bitching and convincing it like absolutely everyone. He hates Stars Hollow, but does he ever leave? No, he doesn't. Does he like help out with every single ridiculous festival that town has? Yes, he does. Um, so while he, you know, on the surface, you know, you know, is like gruff and grumbling, um, he really loves and is committed to the people around him. Uh, Flynn is essentially the exact same way because uh, not only is he the only mechanic in town and helps everyone with, you know, their cars or their tractors or whatever, um, he is also a, a volunteer in the Coast Guard rescue team. So he's like fixing cars and saving lives. That's what Flynn does. <laughs> this is not bad boyfriend material at all. <laughs> no, but everyone in town hates him because he deigned, he had the audacity to leave the island at one point. And the only reason he came back is because his dad died and he took over running the local mechanic shop. So Nathan uh, comes up with a plan and Flynn agrees. And very quickly, they go from fake boyfriends to fake boyfriends with benefits. Um, uh, so they've known each other. They have a history together. Um, and they just, like, uh, they just, despite the fact that, you know, um, they're, like, opposites, the opposites attract thing is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have, like, undeniable chemistry. So there's that. So in between all their like uh, furtive booty calls, um, Nathan <laughs> is trying to deal with all the various disasters of the wedding, and Flynn is busy like saving lives. At one point, the the groom falls into the you know bay, and he has to go rescue him. That kind of stuff. So that that's what we're dealing with here. Is they keep stealing these little moments together and they quickly realize they may like seem like opposites on the outside but inside they're really suited to one another they get along actually really really well um so they end up of course falling in love and as we work towards the end of the book um flynn is presented with um some information um uh, small town gossip mill has constantly been churning about Flynn all these years that he's been back and we learn something uh, that is actually true uh, and Flynn is presented with the opportunity to not only leave the island but with an incredibly big check in his pocket but Flynn of course uh, makes the right decision and he ends up staying on the island with Nathan so I really recommend this book I think it's super um, funny, but in an incredibly British way. Mm -hmm. um, everyone on this small town is like super snarky. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, so are uh, Nathan and Flynn. They've got a really uh, interesting um, chemistry and the way they kind of banter. And as the British say, they take the piss out of one another. Um, so it's really interesting and really engaging. And another thing that T.A. Moore has done is, is that the narrative is told in alternating viewpoints, essentially. But at the very beginning of each chapter, there is a brief anonymous quote from someone in town. So in Nathan's chapters, <laughs> um, they're, they're like coming up with ridiculous plans to like fix him up with someone. In Flynn's chapters, it's little 
pieces of like outrageous gossip about you know oh he he's like a, he had a secret marriage when he was on the mainland or you know he was a spy or just these absolutely stupid ridiculous things that you know small town gossips get up to so not only did i like the chemistry of the two main characters but of the like all of the secondary characters like the wedding guests and all of the people from the town it's really great stuff and i highly recommend wanted bad boyfriend by t.a moore that sounds delightful. And the island, to me, just from your quick description, makes me think of Mackinac Island. If you're going to equate it to somewhere pretty in the much. States. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. Let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go down a, a darker path in your book. Uh-oh. Because, uh, yeah, romantic suspense time. So <laughs> this week I read uh, or listened to Diversion by Eden Winters uh, with some narration by Darcy Stark. Um, Eden's Diversion series has been rec recommended to me for some time now, and I'm so happy I took the leap. This first book's actually rather on the on the older side of things. It came out in 2012, but the audio just came out in October of 2018 with, again, narration from Darcy, who's new to me, but does a great job with both the, the suspense aspects and the romance in this book. Now, this is Enemies to Lovers and Workplace, all mixed up into one romantic suspense story, and it centers on agents for the Southeastern Narcotics Bureau. Uh, Richmond Lucky Lucklider, and he loves his name, by the way, um, <laughs> and Bo Schlollenberger. Um, Eden, you gave me some big names to say there in this. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Lucky's nearing the end of this forced stint on the job. Uh, he was forced into it as his way out of jail. Bo is also new, and he's very eager to do well in this job, but he's also here because he's got some incidents in his past. They end up working together to bring down a ring of drug diversion and insurance fraud that involves a doctor, a drug manufacturer, and a drug destruction company. So we learn a lot about just the drug industry in this book, which I actually found quite enjoyable. I fell so much in love with gruff, no-nonsense Lucky right away. He's extremely good at his job, mostly because he used to be on the other side of the law. But he exudes frustration and irritation at what he has to do and who he has to do it with and why he has to do it. And yet, much like your guy, mm -hmm. he's such a teddy bear inside. <laughs> and he does this because he cares about getting the job done right mm -hmm. to keep these bad drugs away from people. Uh, but the friction that is stirred up when Lucky is saddled with mentoring Bo is just sublime. This was like right out of a Damon Sway course of friction and how friction makes the characters really just pop. Uh, Lucky's looking to ride his desk out during his last few weeks at the Bureau, but his boss has these other ideas. Bo's very green in terms of what he has to do, and, but he is ex-military, so I mean, he's no pushover either, and he knows how to you know get in there, play a role, get the job done. But he also can take exactly what Lucky dishes out, because he's out to really like piss off the newbie to kind of just, you know, give him the grit that he's going to need for this job. But you know what? Eventually Bo gives as good as he gets. Uh, and that just makes that friction pop even more. Add to that the fact that Lucky is now battling himself because he's developing feels for Bo. And yeah, it just all just... <laughs> Uh, the other thing that this friction brings out in this book is a ton of humor. As I mentioned, these two know how to push each other's buttons, whether it's blasting Billy Ray Cyrus before breakfast, forcing the other one to eat healthy, being messy. It's everything that works in an odd couple relationship. And so often I was just laughing while they're like poking at each other. But it's those little sweet nudgings too that help them figure out there's much more to their relationship. Now, as I mentioned, both men have complicated backstories here, and it ends up and just makes you feel all the more for them. Lucky ended up at the Bureau after going to prison because of a part he played in a large-scale drug operation, but it was also something that ripped at his heart because he fell in love with the guy who was behind it all. And when it all came crashing down, Lucky actually helped put him away, and he was sure he wanted no part in loving anybody ever again. Uh, Eden did such an amazing job creating this pain for Lucky, and it's really devastating, the story, but then it makes you all the more just fall in love with the guy as he starts to come back out of his shell. 
Bo did illegal things too to help at X, but then he ended up also getting hooked on some illegal substances at one point. It's very difficult for him to be around a pharmacy because he's essentially in recovery, but his job also requires it. He's also got abuse in his past, and and Lucky just falls into the role of protector. They both essentially protect each other, but it's really pronounced for Lucky because he does everything he can to keep Bo away from the triggers. And it's just, it's so sweet. I kept coming back to it sweet. This is a really tense book, but then there's just these awesome sweet nuggets in it. Eden also takes great care in how all this backstory is presented. It's not like one barf up of backstory at all. These men, as they push past their posturing and disdain for each other, it's really a natural peel back of their emotions. There are ways that friends and coworkers and eventually lovers kind of, you know, reveal each other's backstory. And it's the good and bad is offered in such a good equal measure that it was it was perfect. I keep coming back to perfect too in how I like this book. Uh, the one thing in the story that I really wish had been a little different is that Bo's point of view was never presented. The whole book was from Lucky. And while I I wouldn't say, it, it didn't wreck the book for me, I really wanted to know what was rattling around in Bo's head as he was being antagonized by Lucky and then later as he was falling for Lucky as well. Um, and maybe that'll crop up later in the series as well. Now, the Diversion series is now up to book seven, so I've got a lot of catching up to do. Book seven came out in January of this year, and the third book was just released in audio back in February. So I'm looking forward to catching up on more of the Diversion series by Eden Winters. Sounds good. Yeah, now you've got one more book for us because you've had a, a reading week. Um, yeah, I want to talk about IRL in real life after Oscar book one. That's a really long title uh, for a really great <laughs> book. Um, it's by Lucy Lennox and Molly Maddox. In real life combines the classic alpha billionaire character trope with the time-honored scenario of two characters who are combative in real life but are secretly corresponding with one another and falling in love. Um, that's my long-winded way of saying <laughs> it's similar in setup to classic movies like Shop Around the Corner and you've got Mail, uh, the old Judy Garland musical in the good old summertime, and the musical She Loves Me. It's the way that the characters write to one another has like changed and evolved over the years, but the premise essentially remains the same. Um, in this particular book, there's also hints of enemies to lovers and opposites attract, so um, this book is ripe with tropey goodness. <laughs> Uh, so what's it all about? Um, it's about a nice guy geek named Connor who is in New York to sell his mother's biomed technology to a ruthless CEO. And the evening before his big presentation, he decides to live a little and begin sexting with who he thinks is the sexy hotel bartender. But it's not. Um, the text exchange he ends up having with a stranger, who he calls Trace, is amazing, and through several flirtatious and super hot online conversations, they uh, begin a flame. At the meeting the next morning, Wells Grange recognizes Connor thanks to the Dalek tie that he is wearing. And Connor is the hot and horny guy he sexted with the night before, and his first inclination is to use this information to leverage um, his business negotiation with Connor. But Wells quickly begins to fall for him, both the sexy online version and the awkward real-life version. And as they work through the contracts for the sale, Wells continues his deception, but as they spend several days together and get to know one another, um, Connor is unaware that um, Wells and Trace are the same person. And as we follow our heroes, almost in real time, uh, they fall in love while work, working together, and they go out to dinner and take cute character rides in Central Park, that kind of thing. But once the business deal is finalized, Wells and Connor finally give in to their attraction and sleep with each other. And um, needless to say, it's amazing and totally life-altering <laughs> altering for both of them. But as in cases in stories like these, Connor finally puts two and two together before Wells can come clean about his sexting alter ego. And Connor is, like, humiliated and justifiably furious. So he packs his bags and returns to North Carolina with zero intention of ever speaking to Wells again. I'm going to be super upfront with you guys. There's certain aspects of the billionaire trope that I personally find problematic. Um, and I was on board with Wells and Connor for most of the story. But there were moments when I had a hard time dealing with certain aspects 
of Wells's um, alpha hole personality. <laughs> um, the whole alpha hole thing is like part and parcel for the billionaire trope. Um, but in in my view, if the ending of this book was going to be believable, Wells was going to have to like literally move mountains and pull off one of the biggest mea culpas in like romance novel history. Um, and I'll say it may not have been the biggest, but Lucy and Molly crafted a finale that was truly heartfelt and genuinely appropriate for our two heroes. Um, so to make amends, Wells makes sure Connor's sick mom is well taken care of and uh, ends up as part of an experimental treatment program. Her illness was part of the reason that Connor needed the money for the business deal in the first place. And later, when Connor is unable to attend a comic convention to unveil an important new develop in his gaming business, um, Wells steps in and personally gives a rousing presentation on Connor's behalf. It's uh, I, it's, it's really difficult to describe here, um, but it's super sweet. Um, Wells really puts himself out there, puts you know his reputation and his feelings on the line, uh, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> Wells proves that he's not the billionaire alpha hole that he seems, so yay for true love and happily ever after. Um, I really liked these two, despite some of my misgivings. Uh, I think all's well that ended well, uh, and I was really happy for these two characters. Um, as always, Lucy Lennox uh, delivers in spades. This is, uh, if you like her books, I, I guarantee you're going <laughs> to love this. Um, she co-wrote this with her sister, Molly Maddox, and I really like the work that they did here on this story. It's really good. Like I said, it is like trope laden. Uh, and if billionaires are indeed your thing, you are going to plot. You're going to love this book <laughs> so very much. A quick note, this, as I mentioned, this is the first book in the After Oscar series. Now, what does that mean? It's not like readily apparent. It's not because you didn't mention anybody named Oscar. <laughs> um, at, we learned through the story, there are several characters in this book who once dated a guy named Oscar. Oh. Um, Oscar remains off page, and I as as I see you know the books moving forward, uh, the connecting thread through all the books is going to be this one guy, um, <laughs> and how their lives change and evolve after they've had a relationship with Oscar. Okay. Um, the second book has already been announced. L O L uh, is going to be coming out on April second of twenty nineteen. So. I know I'm looking forward to that one, and uh, hopefully you will too. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at facebook.com slash biggayfictionpodcast and see what we get up to next. So we're excited today to welcome back Jason T. Gaffney and Kevin Held to the podcast. These guys were here for a special bonus episode back on January 24th, and they were talking at the time about Analysis Paralysis, which was actually hitting the theaters in Palm Springs later that week. Uh, now, they're here today to talk about their brand new movie that they're working on called Out of Body, which you reviewed a few episodes back in its audiobook form. Mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about their podcast called The Bright Side also. These guys are hilarious to talk to. We almost didn't have to say anything and just let them go off on their own. <laughs> now, we will give a caution here that the audio's a little funky in this, and I couldn't fix it. There's a little bit of an echo there, but you will it will not impair your enjoyment of the interview. So let's get to that. Welcome back to the show, Jason and Kevin. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Nice to be back. How you been? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had you on before. We were talking all about analysis paralysis, but you guys have a lot more going on besides that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You're actually in pre-production right now on a film called Out of Body. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Tell us what that one's about. So Out of Body is basically a story where um, it's a friends to lover rom-com. And basically uh, Malcolm, who's Kevin's character, uh, has his body stolen from him and he kind of ends up as a spirit for a while and he has to prove that he exists to me, Henry. Uh, and then when that finally happens, we do some magic, we fight some demons, 
we might get the body back. There's definitely a happily ever after because it's a rom com, and uh, you and your and happily ever afters. Yeah, it's gosh. important. <laughs> I know, I know, but I just want the rom. <laughs> just one time, I want a rom com to be okay, like, and then it's mo- it's mostly romantic and funny, but everyone does die. <laughs> But they die hilariously. Uh, it's a rom-com drum. <laughs> they have death by rubber chicken. <laughs> and what was kind of the, the the inspiration behind this movie this time? I was just... I, I don't even know how this idea came in my head, but I was sleeping one day, and I woke up, and I was like, oh, that'd be really cool. A movie where someone's dead, but they wanted to be together... But then they didn't get to be together, and then they have to fight to get their body back and come back to life. And so I wrote a kind of a, a, a similar but different kind of script, and we did a table read, and my mom was a part of the table read, and she was like, I love the story you have here. Can I take it, and can I change a lot of it and make it <laughs> like super like super romance with the comedy? And so this this uh, particular movie uh, and book and audiobook is definitely heavier on the romance than the comedy as opposed to analysis paralysis, but it's, in my opinion, really really good because the the romance really ma- it's, it's gripping. It really gets you right in the the heartstrings, mm-hmm. and um, and she basically saw what I was going for and was able to finesse it and really kind of mold it into what my my kind of original vision was and then some mm-hmm. so i'm really i'm really psyched about it it's it's uh it's got a little bit of everything yeah um uh not too long ago uh i talked about the novelization of out of body here on the show um jason your mom suzanne brockman of course wrote that novelization uh and yes. I, it was rather amusing like i think in the foreword she kind of does like a behind the scenes thing where she kind of tells that story where she says uh, jason this is great but do you mind if i take it and make it better <laughs> yeah <laughs> and here's the thing i I am all about that. If you, if like the the filmmaking is such a collaborative process, and mm-hmm. storytelling can be a really collaborative process, and I want to make good movies. And so I was really happy with the script that I had written. But when someone who's as great of a writer as my mom is comes and says, "I want to, I want to have fun with this, and let me, let me just see what I can do with it," I'm like. Hell yeah! <laughs> Take it. Yeah, have at it. And the uh, the end result is really a script, a novel, and a script that really looks like if a brilliant improviser and plot maker and gay comedy guy let his script be taken over by a best selling romance novelist, what would happen? It would be this. Yeah. You know, and so it's really got great, great aspects of all of those elements. Yeah, I I really enjoyed the book and the audio book as well. And I think it's um, a really unique opportunity for people who are interested in Out of Body, the movie, to uh, check out the audio book. And sort of it's essentially like a preview of uh, yep. what they're going to be getting when uh, the film comes out to the public. Um, can you give yeah, us a, a little bit of an idea about what it was like to... Um, kind of get into the material early before you even like were thinking about shooting um, by, by recording the audiobook. Well, I can tell you for for my part, like since I'm not one of the writers on this, uh, there, which is you know traditional for me because I'm not usually with the writers on a project that I'm acting in. Uh, but it's completely unprecedented to have a novel that you get to perform about the thing before you even film the script you know so we get like as an actor it's a freaking dream because i have so you know how actors have to create subtext and everything i just have to go to the book you know it's like it's like don't worry i don't have to make it it's already been written down for me so if i'm wondering like what's happening for malcolm now what's going on there um what's the deep deep part of it it's already written out for me you know so i would say yeah so the book is available it's on it's called out of body it's on audible.com um, and I, I would say don't um, deprive yourself of the opportunity to say the book was better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it was really cool to, to do the audio book in general because uh, it was our first audio book yeah. for both of us as narrators. And we um, – when, when we were talking about doing it, when, uh, we were talking with my mom about it. And 
I was interested in the idea of, of recording it in a way where it was more like a radio show where we are our characters' dialogue voices all the time, even if it's in the other person's point of view. So whoever's point of view reads the, the descriptive stuff uh, in the chapters, but if Malcolm's speaking, even though I'm the narrator of that chapter, he still says his line, and he still says the lines of the other characters that he had been assigned and vice versa for me. And that was really kind of fun uh, to do because, you know, how often do you get to do kind of a radio show acting gig? Yeah. And it was also really fun for me as a director to uh, get to do this with Kevin in advance because, like, he now really knows the story. And I know he knows the story. So I know that when he comes to set, that's going to be really easy. Mm -hmm. And I got into the head of the other characters as well, reading them, and, and, and that will help me be able to hold my other actors' hands and kind of with them through their parts. And, and and still allow them to bring what they want to bring to the role and have it blossom into how great it can be. Yeah, and, and that's like all separate and apart from the experience of actually recording the, the audio book, which you might think was done uh, him some and then me some in uh, or on consecutive days or anything but it was actually live together so we actually recorded in a space that had two uh, recording booths in it we could both for each other so that when I am narrating a um, uh, a section and it's his line I can hear him do it and then I jump back in so there was it was live editing there was like a, to take out any breaths or anything or mess ups or anything so but we got to you know it was amazing because I had him in my head the whole time doing it too so that was wonderful it's a great experience you know that's amazing especially how it connected to your to your even now pre-production process that you're involved in because you're getting ready to shoot in about a month from when we're recording mm -hmm. um, yeah in pre-production, give everybody kind of an idea of what that means. What's going on as you get ready for your 12 days of shooting? So basically what I just did was uh, go through each of the scenes and break them up on a piece of paper so that I now have the page count number, like how many pages each scene is. These are them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little strip of paper. Each one of these is a scene. And... Uh, and basically, it's the page count when what when it starts, who is in the scene, all of that stuff. Because I need to, um, you know, I don't have every actor every day. I'm going to have Kevin every day because he's one of the leads. But there's other parts in it where they're only going to film for one day to any anywhere from one to three days. And so you have to plan their scenes on the same day. And this time, we're going to actually be filming in two different locations because our neighbors next door. Uh, sold their house to flippers and they're doing construction and it's been kind of never ending so we can't film while there's heavy construction going on in this house so we're going to do a lot of stuff at my father-in-law's house and then we'll come get the rest of it after they're done here um, and so I've been doing that with my dad and breaking it into those days while simultaneously working with my cinematographer Nisha to map out which shots are needed for each scene and what angles are we doing. So I've got little maps on the other side of the table here, uh, basically of me drawing out the room layout and doing little circles with an M for Malcolm and an H for Henry, and then arrows pointing, they go here, and then they go here, and then Oh they my go god, here. and this isn't even talking about how to deal with SAG paperwork or any of the art direction that he's doing, or any yeah. of the clearances that he's getting for this or that kind of thing. Yeah, we've got, uh, we're gonna have, uh... Andrew... He's a bit of a doer. <laughs> we got Andrew Christian giving us underwear again. Oh yeah, we have more um, Andrew Christian underwear over here. I'm, I'm working with some other companies too, so uh, Outfit uh, is a uh, gay, uh, like, sports good wear. They gave me a hat to use for the movie. Mm -hmm. He's been, been stenciling t-shirts yep. and the hand designed t-shirts specific to the characters i'm going to be making him a specific shirt three times because he wears the same outfit the whole movie and so if anything spills on it got to be good mm -hmm. and and not spilled upon uh because he's magical he can't get stains um and so it's it's, it's intense there's a lot going on like I, I pinterest is my best friend I've been learning all about how to make DIY Halloween decorations because, again, when, you, when you're low budget, you can't spend, you know, $3,000 on set design. You can spend, like, $200. And 
so you have to get a little crafty to start thinking like, okay, I've got five pages of construction paper and a pair of scissors and some tape. How can I make this look like I spent a lot of money on it? <laughs> He's like MacGyver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's his experience with pre-production. Mine's a little bit different because I'm not all the hyphenates. Uh, so so I'm, I'm busy making no changes at all to my daily routine. <laughs> you do have a script to learn. <laughs> sure, when I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> We're at your house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, now, I love... The creative, the, the the creating part, like creating the artwork, it, it actually makes me feel calm. The paperwork stresses me out, and so Matt thankfully uh, jumps on that grenade and deals with SAG-AFTRA, and and making sure that all the paperwork's there and all the money is in the right place and and all that stuff. So thank you, Matt. And <laughs> we should say Matt is your husband, so he he's in yes. the production uh, yeah, family. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now that our listeners know how completely awesome and funny this project is going to be, can you give us a little bit of info about the Indiegogo campaign? Yes, we have an Indiegogo campaign. Um, basically, we uh, crowdfunded uh, Out of Body on Kickstarter first, a successful crowdfunding campaign uh, last year. And Indiegogo came to us and said, we'd like to do a uh, in-demand campaign for you. So we have an open-ended campaign on Indiegogo right now where you can uh, be, help sponsor the film, help uh, and get some fabulous rewards such as DVDs of Out of Body when it finally is, is all finished. Uh, you can get DVDs of Analysis Paralysis, our last uh, feature film. I'm going to get these down from the thingy here. So you can show people. You can actually, because now, now we're in uh, you know, the second feature film that stars the two of us. Like yeah. we've got other projects that have to do with like if you're if you're fans of of analysis paralysis or perhaps the audiobook of Out of Body, you can get these copies. You can get copies of all that stuff. And so, on as we are on the way to becoming kings of all media. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah, so if if you go to um, Indiegogo. Um, dot com and you uh, go indiegogo dot com forward slash projects forward slash out of body feature length LGBT rom com movie it's a very long title really why don't you go to indiegogo dot com and search out of body <laughs> yes <laughs> or just come to our show notes it'll be much easier yes do that, yeah. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> exactly go to the big Cape podcast website and the, it's going to be in the show notes right yeah now. Exactly. Uh, another place you can find out uh, information about Out of Body in the future and, and any sort of campaigns we're having, etc., is if you go to tinyletter.com forward slash my pet hippo and uh, join our newsletter, you'll be able to find out pro- uh, things about analysis paralysis or Out of Body or our podcast, The Bright Side with Kevin and Jason. Mm-hmm. All sorts of fun stuff. And uh, yeah, so it, and, and basically, indie film, it, it, it's low budget. So every dollar really does make a difference. Like it, if if we get enough money to, to buy a better meal for the cast and crew, everybody's spirits raise it gets raised up a little higher, you know. Or we can afford an extra day of filming, or we can afford. It, it's just it really does matter. So thank you to everyone who has supported us so far, and thank you to everyone who comes and supports us after this. Yes, indeed. Now, Kevin had this wonderful term about you guys, you know, essentially taking over media. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned the podcast, The Bright Side with Kevin and Jason. Uh, It's a comedy podcast about history. How did this idea spark? Because this just adds to you, I imagine, having to research these historical things. Uh, And now Jason does all the research. For this, you know, and and that's huge. It's incredible, like, like, because basically he doesn't have enough to do. But the impetus for the podcast, which is the bright side with Kevin and Jason, is there. This, you know, there's so much bad news all the time, and my mom taught me how to look on the bright side of stuff. You know, if I got one thing from my mom, it was to, I would always complain about this or that. And she'd, she would constantly remind me of there's something good here, you know, and you have to find that. And so that's really the gem of this, really the heart of that show is that, especially when you look around at the news right now, there's so much bad stuff that is going on, but you have to also recognize that, that, 
bad stuff creates an opposite reaction. And so who is making the good out of that? You know, who is looking at that and reacting to it in a way of love or in a way of furthering acceptance or, you know, who's who's looking at the transgender ban, for example, that was finally instituted by the Supreme Court. And who is saying, you know, I want to reach out and tell my trans brothers and sisters that you are people and you are valuable and your service is useful and we love you. You know, so who's who's doing that? You know, and so that's what the. um the podcast really kind of focuses on when well, we do wallow in some tragedy uh, on on the podcast because every week we take a historical episode of some of some varying degree of tragicness and uh, talk about it. Uh, but then we also every episode find out what that what good that led to. And uh, it it kind of came about a long time ago after analysis paralysis, um, like. As Kevin had mentioned in the, the last episode, we talked a little bit about how we, we met on a student film and uh, and basically got along really well really quickly. And then we started hanging out with our uh, together with our husbands and going on double dates. And so that's – and it's kind of formed this bond. And after analysis paralysis, which was so much fun, it was 10 days of basically seeing Kevin and laughing and having a good time. I was mm-hmm. like, I don't want to wait a year and a half for right. the next project. I want to do something now it's with true. you. It's true. The experience of just chatting on uh, about a topic on a set or something was so much fun. And we thought, we should bottle this. And then we thought, what? you can't. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a method for that. It's called a podcast. And that's what we started yeah you know so now i get to come over here every damn week yes <laughs> come to the valley you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i moved to westwood i was hoping that my uh, second bedroom would be a good place to record but it's not it's not good I too know. much noise there you, the valley's a lot of things but it is quiet it is quiet <laughs> <laughs> it, it must be, unless they're doing construction next door <laughs> right <laughs> you could just change that second bedroom into a soundproof area uh, no, actually, currently we didn't have any. We moved from a house that had a lot of storage into a, a house that had another bedroom but no storage. So that mm. second bedroom has just become basically the id of our house. Mm. <laughs> you know, everything's yeah. like ah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that Harry Potter. What's that closet? The room of requirement. Yes, yeah. it's the room of please don't go in there. <laughs> actually, now guys, I'm curious. How do you choose? which historical events to feature and how much research goes into each episode. That's a hundred percent question for Jason, because <laughs> though I feel that the podcast is a 50, 50 pursuit because Jason uh, does all of the research for the topics that we do. And I don't ever know what we're going to talk about until I get here. Uh, but then I do all the web mastering and editing. Yeah. I put up the show notes and I do all of that stuff. So I feel like we end up spending around the same amount of time oh, on absolutely. things. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, I it, it generally about a day of work. I I kind of surf the web. I find a topic that like I kind of search the you know the rabbit hole as to like what kind of weird historical thing is this? And I'll like Google really weird stuff. So my search history is <laughs> yeah, they're coming for you. Completely mad uh, <laughs> at this point. But uh, but like. You know, I'll, I'll look up like uh, wild strikes, historical funny, and see what I get from it. Um, but I really, honestly, there's been a ton of them that I've gotten um, through recommendations of friends and family, and uh, and listeners of the podcast, and and we really encourage listeners to throw ideas at us because there's there's some really obscure events in history that. I don't know about that I would love to know about and and I could easily find it if I knew to search for it um, and so if, if anyone out there listening has weird events definitely uh, tweet me or email me you can find him at Jason T Gaffney on Twitter and tell yeah. him and I don't want to know about it and, uh, <laughs> and that's right Kevin has to stay in the dark <laughs> right. so what I look for also is to try to look for topics where there's a lot of tragedy but you can still make fun of it. Like a, if it's 
a natural disaster, I try to find one where people made bad decisions with the natural disaster. Not that it's just like everyone got screwed and they tried to do the right thing, but they still got screwed. Because mm-hmm. you can't really make fun of those people. That's just sad. It's just um, mean. Yeah. And it's really not. I mean, I know we talk about a lot of when we're talking about a lot of tragedy and that's kind of what we focus on. But it's not a cruel show. It's not a schadenfreude show, really, um, because the ultimate goal is to find out what the hopeful aspect of it who turned that situation into something good you know mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh and you'd be surprised like we generally can find it <laughs> i don't think we've found one yet where there's really nothing no bright side to it no because <laughs> the arc, you know the arc of history is long and you never know what the end result of a pebble you know you know when a pebble goes into a puddle you don't know how are the ring they're gonna go you know and so like that's we talk about that event but that could lead to something incredible later you know for you kevin since you come in cold to these Mm -hmm. what's been of the episode so far the one you're like what (laughs) what did i just hear (laughs) oh my god every well the empire panic for example (laughs) has been insane uh like like i have a feeling when i when i post the episodes I have a feeling like I hope my my mom and I listened to the Christmas episode over Christmas, and at the end of it, she said that was funny, and I learned some stuff. So that's what it's like. It's like, oh, good, there we go. That's what I would like people to have from it. It was like, oh, I enjoyed that, you know, conversation. That was fun and stuff. But also, God, who knew? Yeah, that's amazing. Because every I, he's pretty good at this. Every episode, there's going to be some point where I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> Human beings did this? You know? Well, again, it's I, always, yes, they did. Oh, Lord. It's also, it's gotten, um, it's gotten way more fun to do the research than it initially was because I was really nervous the first couple episodes to like, oh my god, is this going to be funny? How can I make this funny? And I, I was trying a little like we actually have a couple episodes that just never aired because I was trying too hard as opposed to just seeing that yeah that was absurd I don't need to say anything except what they said and and now that I've kind of um, mastered that to a degree I mean I'll always I'll keep getting better as, as time goes on but now I can really see <laughs> now I can really see uh, like as I'm reading stuff I'll be like oh I know that Kevin's gonna hear that and go, stop it. And then he's gonna <laughs> call it out. He's gonna call it the absurdity of it. I don't mm-hmm. need to do anything except say, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And then she picked up the knife and stabbed her own foot. And it's like, why? Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a knack for history before this, Jason? Or did, did this just kind of happen? Um, so I've always loved history. I, I always loved the, the idea of history. When I was actually a little kid, I used to um, play with blocks a lot, and it's probably why I like being a a producer and a storyteller. I I used to made like this giant castle and a giant village and an army of bad guys, and I acted out this like soap opera for years with the royal family and and all that. And I was fascinated with the the Romanovs and stuff, so I kind of like did a little spoof on them, and um, so I kind of created like my own worlds and history and stuff. And so when I can find sites that tell historical stories like a story which is what history should be told as because it essentially is our story Mm. it's really fun it's really exciting to read it and be like no oh my goodness that person's totally the villain then you read a couple more paragraphs and you're like oh no they're misguided (laughs) they they really they have a heart of gold they just did they didn't know and then five pages later you're like no they're just a dick (laughs) and and it's exciting it's riveting it gets you you're on edge of your seat constantly with how people just constantly mess up yeah and then occasionally you have a hero who's just like actually a good person you're like what's the catch Mm -hmm. so yeah no history is really fun it can it especially when it's told with a fun storytelling lens because yeah, and i think that that's like the the thrust of the podcast is also it's about the topic sure but it's also just about how jason and i interact with each other and we just yeah. have such a fun friendship and and and, and, and i don't mean that it's fun from the outside i hope it is but it's fun from the inside of it so i yeah. have such a good time with him that whatever we're talking about is going to be fun for me that's awesome so besides out of body and more podcast episodes what else is coming up for you both? I may never work again. 
who knows? <laughs> We've actually started writing the sequel to Analysis Paralysis with the hope of filming it uh, at the end of the year, um, with the additional hope of trying to film it in Palm Springs. Um, First time hearing of that. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so, Breaking I mean, news. <laughs> we're gonna do. What I we, love Palm Springs. We're gonna do what we can to make it work, and it would require uh, assistance from the Palm Springs community sure, to help house us and and give us locations and stuff. It's gonna be uh, all on the gondola, it, only there. What gondola? The gondola up to the mountain thing. Oh yeah, that gondola. <laughs> the whole thing is set on the gondola. I was le legitimately <laughs> thinking like the gondola with the little yeah, the stick canals of Palm like, Springs. What? <laughs> <laughs> But um, another thing that I'm actually working on is uh, my dad and I wrote a couple of novellas uh, that you can get on Amazon. Uh, what are they comedy called? Series. The California Comedy Series. Yes, and uh, I wrote the version of Fixing Frank um, with the hopes that to get that kind of ball rolling. And it's it's definitely a film that requires a bigger budget than what we have right now. But I'm starting to get those wheels in motion for, you know, movie four, five, six, sometime in the near future. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm working on. Yep. We'll keep cranking them out. Yeah. If people will keep putting them on screens and things, we'll yeah. keep making them. The goal is to make people laugh. That's – I feel like that's why I'm put on Earth, and I feel like that was <laughs> why you were put on Earth. So. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, I know I laugh at you whenever I see you. So that's probably true. Do we get new California comedy anytime soon? Um, we, I've been talking about that with my dad. We actually have a couple that are in the works. Um, it's just trying to figure out when we have the time to sit down and edit it. I think after Out of Body, I'll be able to take a look back at one of them that, uh, that we wrote a while ago and kind of tweak it because there were a couple of things that just never felt right. And so it's just figuring out how to fix those uh, kind of plot holes and uh, and then hopefully that'll hopefully that'll be on the market before uh, the end of 2019. Yeah, excellent. And Kevin, what about you? Anything you can you want to throw out for people to keep an eye out for? Super excited about the podcast. Actually, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, the the going into production on Out of Body is really really exciting. I uh, don't have a lot of acting projects coming up after that that I can think of right now, but that's kind of the nature of acting projects. Sure. <laughs> you know, uh, and so uh, the podcast is uh, where you can find us weekly up until the end. And, and actually, we make announcements there about uh, projects that do come up for us, uh, you know, in the interim. So, you know, that'd be the, you know, to be a loyal listener to the show would be the best way to find out about what's new with us. Yeah. Oh, and I almost forgot. We're going to try uh, in some way, whether it's self-published uh, or or with uh, some other company helping us. Uh, the goal is to turn the California comedy series into audiobooks as well, uh, similar to Out of Body. Oh, fantastic. So both of you voicing? Yeah, for, for two of them. One of them, uh, I'm the plan is to have uh, my good friend David Singletary come in as the role of Mike, uh, since that role is uh, African-American, and my friend David Singletary is African-American, and I'm all and Kevin about, Held is very much not. I'm all about <laughs> own voices, reading parts and stuff like that, and uh, so he and he's great. You're gonna love him. He is great. Excellent. I'm a little jealous, but I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for telling us about Out of Body in the podcast. We wish you much success with those. Well, thank much you. success with your own podcast, thank gentlemen. You, yes. So thanks again to Jason and Kevin for hanging out. They just finished up the filming on Out of Body this past Friday on March 15th. So looking very forward to seeing what that finished production is going to be like when it gets there. So congrats to them for that. Uh, happy to announce this week that we're also introducing author interview transcripts to the show notes page. So if you go to the show notes for this episode, number 180, down at the bottom, under the show notes themselves, you'll actually find the interview transcript for that entire interview sitting down there. And you'll also find it in your podcatchers as well. So now you can not only listen to the interviews, but you'll be able to read them as well. Yes. Um, accessibility is important. Uh, and this is something we've wanted to try for a very long time. So we are trying to roll it out slowly but surely. Uh, hopefully, by episode 200, it'll be a regular part of our show notes page. So if you'd like to check out the transcripts for this particular episode, 
uh, episode 180. All you have to do is go to biggatefictionpodcast.com. Yeah. And we've also started adding uh, the in a, the review material that we do for the book reviews, too. So the book reviews are also out there uh, for your reading pleasure, should you choose to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we have a Patreon for the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. The additional support of our super fans help pay for the cost of producing and distributing this show. Joining is super easy, and you'll get special access to monthly bonus episodes and the opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests and, and lots more. All of the details um, are on our Patreon page. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfiction podcast and uh, as a matter of fact the moment we are done recording this episode we are going to be recording our special uh, patreon bonus for the month of march uh, this month we are doing a special q a episode uh, several of our patreon members have asked us some specific and interesting questions i'm not 100 percent sure how i'm going to answer them just yet uh, we'll see how that goes um, if also if you're curious about uh, what we've got to talk about uh, you can always find out more at patreon.com slash big gay fiction podcast now coming up next week Good friend Brandlin, she's going to be here to talk about some audiobooks that she's listened to recently and what she's got to recommend to us. Yes, we caught up with her at Coastal Magic, which was awesome, and she actually plotted out exactly what she wanted to talk about for next week. So it's going to be good to talk to her. Yeah. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>